So you remember a few weeks ago we did that video on rear differentials? We were using the 9-inch Ford as the example. And we were talking about uh, pinion height as opposed to strength and parasitic losses. And in that video, one or two of you guys commented about we should do a video on the rest of the drive line, you know, the drive shaft forward. So that's what I want to do now. I want to talk about the drive shaft, and more specifically, universal joints and angles. So before we, before we actually get into that, we need to define terms. The difference between a universal joint and a CV joint, a constant velocity joint. Now you've got two types of constant velocity joints. You've got the type that they use like on a front wheel drive car, and then you've also got the type that they used with universal joints, where on certain, especially like luxury cars, like the caddies used to have them, where they would put two U joints in the front, the front section here, and that would create a constant velocity joint. Constant velocity meaning that whenever power is being transferred through it, is going to be smoothly applied to the drive shaft or the driven part. Now a U-joint on the other hand is not supposed to be used at any angles. A U-joint is supposed to function in a straight line and only soak up minor variations as the car let's say goes over bumps and, and or it gets loaded down with stuff. It's only supposed to take up minor variations in, in height or, or in angle. But in our world, dealing with cars, trucks, especially the truck guys, the drive shaft and the universal joint is one of the most misused and abused items in the whole world of this stuff. Because most people don't realize that the U-joint, when it's operated at an angle, is actually creating a pulsating parasitic loss. It's taking power and it's causing a vibration. It's actually causing a strain at the tail shaft of the transmission. Because remember now, you've got the output shaft of the transmission and the yoke, the front yoke, is splined onto that. But to hold that whole assembly steady, there's a bushing in the tail shaft. And when, you've, when you're operating a drive shaft at crazy angles, and you've got that speeding up and slowing down that happens when you put a drive shift, a universal joint at an angle, you're stressing the tail shift bushing. It causes vibration, it causes crazy amount of wear. It's something that you have to avoid at all costs. So the ideal setup is to have a completely straight line from the crankshaft through the transmission, through the drive shift to the yoke. Everything should be in the same plane, no angles built into it. And that's in a perfect world where the car just rolling down the road. And like I said, minor variations are fine. That's what it's designed for. But it's not supposed to be a permanent thing where it's always operating at an angle. For that, you need a constant velocity joint. So now, the amount of power or vibration that's caused when a U-joint is operated at too much of an angle, isn't really felt in the seat of the pants, but trust me, the driveline feels it. And it says it especially feels that vibration that's happening at the tail shaft. The load that's happening, the loading and unloading that's happening at the tail shaft. The more severe the angle of the U-joint or the drive shaft in relation to the, the, the transmission, the more of parasitic loss and that speeding up and slowing down happens. So here's the things you need to look out for. If you're building a car, you're modifying a car, you're doing a rear end swap, you're doing an engine swap, you're, doing, you're, you're changing the drive line of the car. The first thing you need to know is that everything from front to back on the car has to be in a straight line. In the vast majority of cars that we deal with, the rear end has the yoke or the, or the pinion offset from center. So if you look at the car from behind, you'll see that the center section is right there in the center of the car. But the U-joint, or the, the yoke I should say, is going to be offset, basically the, the width of the ring gear. So an example is these Chrysler products. All of these Chrysler products from this era have the drivetrain offset one and three quarter inches to the passenger side. Because like I said, the housing is centered, but the yoke is offset one and three quarter inches. So to, to maintain that relationship of a straight line front to back, the whole drivetrain is offset. So you need to know when you're swapping, let's say a rear end into a car, you need to know that the yoke is going to be in line with the rest of the drivetrain. Same thing with an engine swap. 
If not, you've got to make whatever modifications needed, let's say offsetting the engine and trans or offsetting the rear end to maintain that straight line. Now you get into angles, and this is, this is like so universal because when you're building a car, one of, the, one of the, the, the most common elements is to alter its ride height. You're either going to raise the car, or you're going to lower the car. This is where you start to run into problems. The ideal situation is front to back, from the, from the front of the crankshaft to the rear end, everything should be in a straight line. And if you're building a car that's just going to go down the road, like kind of as they're intended to do, if you're just building a car that goes straight down the road, that's the only thing you need to be concerned with, that all of those components are in a straight line. Now, if you're modifying, you've, you're changing the rear end where it's got a different pinion height, or you're changing the engine and transmission, you need to make whatever allowances you have to to maintain that straight line. So sometimes it could mean raising or lowering the transmission mount to get the angle right, or the whole drivetrain, the whole engine and transmission, raising or lowering it to get that correct height. So like for instance, let's just say you're going from, from a 12 bolt rear that has a high pinion to a nine inch Ford that has a very low pinion. You're automatically inducing an, ex, an extra angle to the drive shift. So you want to make sure that it's as, as continuous straight line as possible. How you do that, that's, that's gonna be up to you because every car is a little bit different, every situation is a little bit different. But do your homework, make your measurements. The other thing we have to talk about is pinion angle because while a car going down the road will have the, the pinion of the rear end level for the most part and it's gonna go, it's gonna rise and fall with the suspension or I should say it'll run, the, the pinion stays, stays level with the ground, but the car, the rest of the drive line, is going to rise and, and fall with the suspension. Those minor variations are fine. And if you're setting a car up as a cruiser, as a driver, dead straight on the pinion is what you want. But now if you're building a drag-oriented car, something that takes a lot of acceleration load, you want to compensate for that loading, the fact that when you put power to the rear end, it wants to rotate upwards. You want to pre-angle the pinion so that when it's under load, it comes up straight. Now the rule of thumb, let's say with a leaf spring car like this, the Chrysler, is between three and five degrees downward angle on the pinion when the car is at rest. Three degrees, you won't find, you won't find any real negative side effect to that angle as you're driving down the road. Five degrees, you start to run into vibrations up at higher speeds. But the, the reason you're doing this is because if it's a drag oriented car, so it's got sticky tires and a bunch of power, and when you put the power to it, the rear end wants to rotate up, that keeps everything in a straight line and eliminates the vibration and parasitic losses that you would find if the drive shift started out at an angle, but it was, the drive shift started out straight, but as you gave it gas, your pinion would rise up and now you're raising the back of the drive shaft in relation to the rest of the drivetrain. So on a drag or an acceleration oriented car, you want to have the pinion set down a little bit. You want, as the power is applied to it, for it to come up and meet the rest of the drivetrain in a straight line. Different cars, different types of suspensions, trailing arm cars, ladder bar cars, four link cars, different types of leaf spring cars, trucks, are all going to take a different angle. They're all going to take a different treatment to that pinion angle. So what you need to do is your own research on your own type of car to find out what the setup, the best setup for that's going to be. You got to keep in mind that a car, that, let's say a 14 second car, a 13 second car, is going to have a lot less pinion rise on acceleration than let's say a 10 or a 9 second car will. So you need to know exactly your type of car at, at its weight with the power level that you're dealing with, the type of suspension, all of those factors go into it so that when you're under acceleration, everything levels out and like I said, the least amount of parasitic loss, the least amount of vibration. Vibration does become a problem when you start to get into, let's say, a more severe drive shift or pinion angle. You get down around five degrees. Well, it'll straighten out under acceleration, but now as it relaxes, especially let's say at the big end of the track, or if it's a street and strip car, 
you, you cruise down the road at 70, 80 miles an hour, you will pick up a vibration because that five degree down pinion angle is constant. It's always got the drive shift in a state of semi bind. Anytime a universal equipped drive shift is operating at any angle other than just dead straight from all angles, there is an amount of bind, there is an amount of parasitic loss, and there is an amount of vibration that gets transferred, especially to the tail shift of the transmission. All right, so I think I covered pretty much everything there is to cover on that. If I didn't, throw it in the comments. And if I did, I hope you got something out of that, and I'll see you tomorrow.